Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today. Welcome to the sixth edition of Expo Chicago, the International Exposition for Contemporary and Modern Art. My name is Stephanie Cristello. I'm the Director of Programming for Expo Chicago, as well as the Editor-in-Chief of The Scene, Chicago's International Journal of Contemporary and Modern Art. We are incredibly pleased to be presenting the second annual edition of the Expo Chicago Art Critics Forum today. The thematic of today's discussion is criticism in the post-truth era. We have a handful of critics joining us from different disciplines and backgrounds, including Christian Viveros Fane, who will be moderating, as well as Sarah Douglas, Anna Bilbao, Kenny Schachter, and Kevin McGarry. Today's panel is presented in partnership with Virgin Hotels Chicago. Without their support, um, we wouldn't be able to present this discussion today, so thank you to, to the Virgin. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you. So, uh, thank you uh, for coming. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Cecilia Kim. Thank you, Tony Carmen, for putting together such a terrific fair again in Chicago and being nutty enough to include this art critics forum. Um, I want to start by introducing my colleagues, the distinguished panelists that are here on the stage. Uh, they each bring a unique outlook to what they do and are guaranteed to do the same with regards to the idea of post-truth and art in an era of uh, a post-truth environment. What does that mean? Um, lots to talk about here, obviously. But I'll start by introducing Sarah first. Sarah is the editor-in-chief of Art News Magazine. She has been an art journalist and editor for over 15 years. Prior to Art News, she was the culture editor at the New York Observer. I imagine that, I think that was before Jared Kushner was the owner, if I'm, he was the owner then? Okay. But Trump, yeah, fine. Okay, well maybe we'll have some stories. Um, uh, and, and uh, blah, 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 blah. So, that, so she was the culture editor for the New York Observer and launched their visual arts site galleries in New York. Douglas has contributed to The Economist, The New York Times, New York Magazine, The Art Newspaper, which she served for four years as U.S. editorial coordinator and The National, among other publications. In 2013, she was the recipient of Art Table's new leadership award. Annabelle Bao, who's uh, next to Sarah, is an editor of After All Journal and a research fellow at the After All Research, research Center in Central St. Martin's University of the Arts, London. She completed her PhD in art history and theory with specialization in curatorial theory and practice at the University of Essex, where she also teaches art history and curating. Anna has worked in various areas of the cultural, the cultural sector, including art fairs, curating, and arts education. Kevin McGarry is a writer based in Los Angeles since 2010. He has been a freelance art writer since 2004, contributing to many print and online art publications, including Art Forum, Artforum.com, Freeze, Art in America, Flash Art, Moose, Kaleidoscope, Art Agenda, and Four Columns, and to lifestyle publications such as T, The New York Times Style Magazine, W Magazine, and V Magazine. He was a recipient of the Andy Warhol Foundation's Arts Writers Grant Program Award for Short Form Writing in 2016. Kenny Schachter is an old friend and colleague. Uh, he's been curating, <laughs> writing, lecturing, and dealing for nearly 30 years, including his regular column for Artnet News. The next is out next week, the next column that is. He also teaches art and economics in the Art Market Studies Program at the University of Zurich. So what we're going to do here uh, today is we're going to go through a, a, a series of short uh, slide and, and uh, talk presentations um, uh, that each of the panelists have prepared for you. We'll basically go in the order which we're seeing. Um, and uh, they'll tell us you know, what they, what they, what they, how they conceive of both the notion of post-truth and um, and of criticism, and maybe even more importantly, art writing or journalism in the post-truth era. Um, uh, it's, um, I think then we're going to engage in, in, in what uh, I hope is a very spirited conversation about the phenomena of post-truth in the macro, right? 
and how it affects the art world and uh, art journalism and criticism in the micro. Uh, finally, we're going to open up the floor for questions from you guys, uh, which I hope there will be plenty of. We've been advised by the powers that be that since this is the last uh, of the panels today that we can run to 610, 615, I'm sure, as compelling as this subject is. Uh, none of us want to miss the dinners or parties that are going to be going on later. Um, now, just to sort of set the table, as it were, for the presentations, um, I, I, I wanted to begin by sort of establishing some ground rule type definitions. Um, let's, let's try and figure out what we're talking about when we talk about post-truth. That term is clearly <laughs> very much out there. Um, but, you know, it needs some defining. Um, so, according to the collabor collaboratively written and as yet non-financialized neo-encyclopedia, that is Wikipedia, post-truth politics, also called post-factual politics, is a political culture in which debate is framed largely by appeals to emotion disconnected from the details of policy and by the repeated assertion of talking points to which factual rebuttals are ignored. Post-truth differs from traditional con contesting and falsifying of truth by rendering it of secondary importance. While this has been described as a contemporary problem, there is a possibility that it has long been part of political life, but was less notable before the advent of the internet. In the novel 1984, George Orwell casts a world in which the state changes historic records daily to fit its propag propaganda goals of the day. Political commentators have identified post-truth politics as ascendant in American, Australian, British, Chinese, Indian, Japanese, Russian, and Turkish politics, as well as in other areas of, of debate driven by a combination of the 24-hour news cycle, false balance in news reporting, and the increasing ubiquity of social media. In other words, it's everywhere, right? In 2016, post-truth was chosen as the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year. Due to its prevalence in the context of that year's Brexit referendum and media coverage of the U.S. presidential election. Speaking of the Oxford Dictionary, here's their brand new definition of post-truth coined do during what will likely be called the year of the Whopper. That would be uh, last year, 2016. Relating to, this is the definition, or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Examples. In this era of post-truth politics, it's easy to cherry pick data and come to whatever conclusions you desire. And some commentators have observed that we are living in a post-truth age. While we run through each of your presentations, I want you to also think about whether the Oxford, uh, Oxford Dictionary and Wikipedia definitions get us any closer to understanding a phenomena that seems to be largely informed by instability and insecurity of the most sort of visceral kind. Um, with that, I hand it over to Sarah. And we'll kick off the presentations. So can everyone hear me? So I think the real challenge here is, can I talk, click, and we'll see. We'll see. It's an experiment. OK, so, aha, OK. So the first thing I was going to do is read you that exact same Oxford Dictionary definition, but now I can skip that and move ahead, luckily, because I have a lot to say, unfortunately. So let's move ahead. Aha. So first I wanted to talk about a little bit about truth in art, because it's an interesting idea. It's a, a, you know, there's a long history of talking about this, and it's too much to get into here, but let's just breeze through a couple of things. You know, this piece behind me, this is um, Bruce Nauman's famous 1967 neon piece, The True Artist Helps the World by Revealing Mystic Truths. So in this piece, Nauman is using a form more familiar from pop and advertising, the neon, to gently mock the idea that there is any such thing as a true artist who in their work somehow reveals universal truths. And by the way, are there even such things as universal truths? So as I said, there is, however, a long history of, you know, so to speak, seeking the truth in art. 
if you poke around on the internet on this topic, you'll encounter things like, do Rembrandt's portraits reveal the truth of human nature, or at least of one human's nature? Also, using the word in a slightly different sense, you can see artists today are using art to speak their own particular truth, um, and to, as they say, speak truth to power. So interestingly, and not to confuse the matter, but the truth, as we find it in art, if you consider it in terms of aesthetic impact and in other ways, it's perhaps closer to that emotions and personal belief in that post-truth definition. Art itself, I think we can all agree, is not what you would call fact-based. Otherwise, we'd get into those old arguments, is a photorealist painting more factually accurate to a scene than an impressionist painting, which is, you might say, truer to how the eye works? Is a photograph more, quote unquote, accurate than a painting? Luckily, we're not here to wade into those waters. We're here to ask, how do we apply the post-truth environment to current issues in art journalism? Since it was founded way, way back in 1902, Art News has been committed to what bizarrely we are now calling fact-based journalism. Throughout the years, the magazine has done hard-hitting articles about things like World War II art restitution, issues that require dogged fact-checking. In print, and in more recent years online, we remain committed to accuracy. I'm showing you here an example of an article we ran in our spring 2017 issue. Um, this happens to be about a group of artists and curators who have been quite vocal um, in their objections to the current president. It also talks about Jared uh, Kushner and Ivanka Trump's connections to the art world through their collecting activities. So I want to go into a little cul-de-sac here about truth, non-truth, and a kind of post-truth in art. So this is a, deep, this is a portion of that article. Um, so this past January, the artist Richard Prince tweeted a screenshot of a post on Ivanka Trump's Instagram account, if you can keep up with that, of an artwork, one of Prince's new portraits uh, series, for which Prince turned an appropriated Instagram post, this one of Ivanka herself, into a large canvas for the wall. You can see this is her, her post that she put up here. So with that tweet, um, Prince wrote in January, this is not my work. I did not make it. I deny, I denounce. This is fake art, like fake news. This is fake art. He claimed he had returned the $36,000 that Ivanka had paid for the work. And um, so now, you know, I would just ask, it, it, you know, even if it's not technically legally possible for Prince to disown this work, and I don't think it is, um, would you want to own this piece if the artist is telling you that the truth is that it's not an artwork by him? that it's fake art? Is the collector who still believes this is a Richard Prince post-truth? Is Prince post-truth for believing he can declare it not his art? Now there are some post-truth related problems we mercifully don't have in art journalism. Let's say you write about something that's happening within an auction house that's not particularly flattering, for instance. There's a possibility you might get sued I suppose, but it's highly unlikely that the head of that auction house would come out and condemn the venue you write for and the entire art media as fake news. So far, fake news has not really been an issue in art journalism, unless you consider the hilarious example of artinfo.com, which recently laid off staff and outsourced editorial to India, and there was a stint where, to make it seem like they still had reporters in important places, they ran stuff under fake headlines such as Berlin correspondent Hans Schneider and Latin American writer Marco Sanchez. But is there non-comic fake news within the realm of art journalism? Well, here's a couple things to think about. And this is an issue in the wider area of journalism. Um, paid content that does not disclose in, form, in some form that it's been paid for. Okay, so that could be sponsored content, could be any number of things. The New York Times does it, they say it's paid for by whoever. But I would just say, and I'm not calling anyone out here, but it's something to look out for if you're reading news or criticism on a you know, news organization that <coughs> is part of a company that hosts galleries in, in any way that pay for that, um, or that's involved, whether directly or indirectly, in selling it. Um, then there's the much bigger um, question. I think this is, this is really Kenny's territory, and he'll talk about it much more interestingly than, than I will. Um, but yesterday when I mentioned the topic of this panel to a dealer here at the art fair, he laughed and he said, well, it's all fake. 
meaning the art market, meaning the art market is opaque. Um, so the sales and prices that you see reported from art fairs, you know, they, they probably come from a PR. Um, are they asking prices or do they encompass the discount that was given? You know, as journalists, we can't possibly verify this stuff. Then there are auction house guarantees. Um, some of you probably know what that is, but when you see a big headline saying such and such painting sold for 50 gazillion dollars, consider that that painting may have simply been sold at the price it was guaranteed to sell for. The auction houses are competing with each other and with galleries to attract consigners or sellers. The house promises them, in many cases, promises them a guaranteed undisclosed minimum price. Then to hedge their risk, they line up clients who agree to buy those works at guaranteed undisclosed floor prices, and that's called a third party guarantee. Guarantors might be bidding on the very works that they've underwritten, setting the price higher than the prearranged floor. I hope you can keep up with me. Also, um, dealers, art dealers, I'm usually or often on the phone, um, are bidding on work by artists that they represent to protect those artists' markets. Okay. So when you're reading an article that just tells you such and such sold for such and such, you know, is that a real auction if the thing has already been, so you get the point. Um, but let's turn to our criticism for a moment. So I think part of this post-truth environment um, is a populist rejection of authority and elites. You know, it's a symptom, as some writers are saying, of late stage democracy. Um, whereas you once had elite art critics writing for elite art magazines, and some of you probably reckon, recognize this Clement Greenberg, um, and people would sort of genuflect and say, oh, the authority has spoken, this art is brilliant, or the authority has spoken, this is worthless crap. Um, you know, the nature of art criticism has changed. Um, you know, you have to factor in things that, that are complexly related, and I'll just throw these things out there. The importation into art criticism of continental theory that had already infected literature. Cultural relativism. Uh, much later, you know, Jerry Saltz's populist Facebook page, which a few years ago gave all these people the notion in an art world where power, at least market-wise, is so concentrated at the top that everyone had a voice. These days, with the advent of the internet and social media, there are just many more sources for art criticism. Everyone has a soapbox, and people can cherry pick what is in their social media fields, and there are all these micro communities. Um, it sort of mirrors what's happening in the political environment. So I'm just showing you these logos, in case you haven't ever seen them before. Um, so you might say our criticism has simultaneously become more democratic and less relevant. Um, you have the incredible phenomenon of Instagram in the art world, which is used both for news and promotion. And sometimes it's hard to tell which is which. And as an aside, let me tell you, at least one mega gallery has its own art lifestyle magazine. And since they have a whole stand here, it's Gagosian has a whole stand in their booth, they have their magazines there. You know, it's a lifestyle magazine. It's amazing. It's very well produced. I've advertised your envy. Anyhow, so sometimes it's hard to tell which is which on Instagram. And now it's de rigueur for every art institution and gallery to have an Instagram account. Then turn back to journalism, you know, with all the competition for attention on the internet, there's the temptation to put on sensational, sensationalistic headlines on stories in order to get the most clicks possible. Headlines that can be misleading if the reader is only skimming them on Twitter rather than reading the whole article, which we all do. So I'm spitballing a little bit here, but I think the devaluation of criticism and the advent a while ago of theory and art journalism has contributed to the art market becoming more of an arbiter. It's given the market and all the lifestyle appurtenances that go along with it more power than they might otherwise have. It's what, apparently, people want to read about. Consider a recent much debated article in the New York Times on 50-year-old painter Mark Grochon, a remarkably non-skeptical article that basically was saying, hey, look at this artist whose prices are really high. $14 million, $22 million for a painting. An article that basically just quotes collectors and dealers saying Grochon's super high prices are justified. Um, you know, if we think about truth in art just from a different angle, you know, what's the truth of an artwork? How do we experience that artwork such that you might say it can speak to us, its particular truth, in a way that we can hear it? Um, this is something called Send Me SF MoMA. Okay, which, don't get me wrong, it's really cool. And this is the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art started this program where you can text them to a number, a series of digits, 
you text them and you say, send me light bulb, you know, send me light, I'll send you some light bulbs. You know, send me whatever and I'll send you a picture. Which is amazing, it's an amazing way to promote their permanent collection. Um, but what if looking at images of art rather than you know, acting as a sort of aperitif to an art visit is increasingly replacing the in-person art experience? There's recently been a spate of gallery closures due to problems in the emerging and, and mid-market. Um, and when closing their galleries, more than one dealer has complained that people are browsing art on Instagram, but they're not visiting the galleries. So very lastly, being an editor, I just want to give a shout out to editing. Because there's a, been a move away from editing and towards reporting, or in many instances, just throwing things up online as swiftly as humanly possible. And let re me remind you, everyone needs an editor, someone who looks at their work before it goes live, as, as they say, in part to assure that aren't, there aren't any errors or ambiguities of language itself that could mislead large numbers of people. So very, very lastly, I just want to say you know, a couple things about like, what I think, you know, I think art journalism does great art journalism right now. I think the industry is struggling. Art journalism is a microcosm within journalism, broadly speaking, um, which is struggling to find a financial model that works, as we all know. Um, so what should art journalists and critics be, be doing? Well, I think it's what they've always done, you know, seeking out the truth. And I think that truth, it's two, diff it's two things. I think for a reporter, it's okay, you know, you have a situation and you think you know what it is, but here's what's going on behind that. And for a critic, it's, it's sort of put it all out there. Don't hold anything back. Make an argument, a strong argument, for you know, why you think this is worthy of presentation in a museum, for instance, or not. So I'm just gonna give you a couple examples of that. This is um, an article that my colleague Andrew Resseth um, wrote for Art News, which got an, just an incredible, it sort of went viral, as they say, online, because he just trashed this Damien Hirst show. But his argument was very, you know, he said, this is why, he didn't just say this is terrible, he, he, and this is a very high profile artist, and he stuck his neck out and he said, this is, you know, I don't think this is worthy of showing on this scale, whether you agree with him or not. Um, this is an article, and I don't mean to call out SF Moment, it's a great museum, but it just happens to be two things that I talk about. But this is, you know, uh, the, the art critic for the San Francisco Chronicle explaining the terms behind the Fisher Collection. So isn't it great that um, these collectors decided to give their collection uh, on very, very long-term loan to a museum, SFMOMA, rather than creating a private vanity-type museum. However, there were terms behind that loan that affect what the museum can do and what they can show. And he's explaining that, and that's important. Um, and lastly, I would just mention, you know, when you talk about, okay, what sort of, um, what's, how's a sausage made in, in the art world, so to speak, right? Um, and you assume that the non-commercial realm, the museums, the nonprofits, are somehow separate from the market, okay? And in spring 2015, Julia Halperin, who was then at the art newspaper, published an investigative piece that showed that almost one third of solo museum exhibitions in the United States during the previous year were, were of artists represented by one of five prominent commercial galleries. Gagosian, Mary Goodman, Pace, David Werner, and Hauser and Wirth. You have to look at that in the context of how are these exhibitions paid for. And often the galleries are giving some money to help put on the exhibition. Collectors are. So I think it's, it's, it's as in the world at large, it's the journalist's job to reveal the truth, the, the fact based truth, um, and to you know, tell, tell their own truth and give some backup for it. So I, I, I went kind of long. No, that was terrific. Thank you. Um, lots to think about, Anna. Shall we? Uh... Okay. So we are, after all, a, a journal uh, founded in 1998 by Charles Esche and Mark Lewis. And now I would like to talk about a little bit about our foundation and how does this relate uh, to post truth. Uh, for the first issue of After All, uh, the pilot issue, Mark and Charles picked as an opener to the foreword a quote by Bourdieu and the importance of the role of the critical intellectual. Yeah. 
the critical intellectual who, according to Bourdieu, opens up questions and reflects upon the conditions of possibilities for those questions, rather than, ne rather than merely accepting commonplaces. They thought that the contemporary artist could also inhabit this space. At that time, after all, was meant to become a platform where contemporary art, together with other practices, was seen as central to our ways of thinking and relating to the world. As I interpret this, this was really in an, an interesting ambition, since it was not only about producing a publication, but also about giving contemporary art a very significant social role, given, as they said, its capacity for symbolic projection. So, I will try to relate this to post rule oh, no. As uh, Christian was saying, I, I'll just repeat it really, really briefly, Post-truth, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, it's relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion that appeals to emotion and personal belief. I won't go on about this for too long, but I do find this definition very post-truth, in fact, and rather problematic. It implies and creates false dichotomies. It makes it seem that politician lines is a, politicians lying is a recent phenomenon. As Richard Seymour points out, it is not even necessarily the case that there has been a metric increase in the volume of political, political line of late. This definition also makes the public both the victim and the victimizer, relieving the actual perpetrators from any serious responsibility. In fact, the aspect of it as, that portrays the public as the victim is full of condescension, a public with no agency that is merely passive, a passive receptacle, yet simultaneously guilty for its own condition. Lastly, it creates a false and axiological dichotomy between emotion and truth, <laughs> conceptually and politically undermining emotion, making it seem less significant in front of rationality. Where have, have we seen this before? The very source of this definition is the Oxford English Dictionary, ostensibly a source of facts, of truth. Post-truth was named the word of the year, as Christian said, in 2016. And this brings me back to the very foundation of After All and the inspiration of its founders on the notion of or produce critical intellectual, who reflects on the conditions of the possibilities for the question posed to her rather than merely accepting commonplaces. If we think about post-truth yeah. as, th as those so-called objective facts being undermined at a very practical level, there are things that we do uh, in our working after all that certainly run in, run in opposition to the so-called post-truth. I'll start with the most pragmatic and move towards more ideological motivations behind the work that we do. To begin with, fact-checking is an important part of our editorial process. The editorial process is still very lengthy. We go back and forth with the authors, discussing ideas before, during, and after the piece is done. However, I, at least as, the edi as an editor, try not to be overwhelmingly critical or policing every single detail. This wouldn't allow any writer to express herself. Very consciously, I allow myself to be mind blown by their ideas, but not without questioning and challenging their assertions. I am constantly asking for authors to expand, to provide further details, to clarify, to use a footnote here and there, to reference adequately, to substantiate their claims. We recently, and this is kind of a product of the, of the cuts, both in education, in academia, and in the arts, that we experienced in England before, and that you, I think, will experience uh, anytime soon. So we recently went from producing three to two issues a year. I think that this is key to running opposition to the superficiality of post-truth. Post-truth belongs to a world of overproduction of everything, of objects, of art, of data. Even academia and research, as I was saying, partly because of the cuts, at least in England, are victims of this model. If you want to keep your position, you have to produce a certain number of articles a year, as if great ideas could be machine-produced. 
This is not only true to the humanities, but to the sciences as well. The pressure to produce leaves you with hundreds of peer-reviewed articles, and the peer-reviewed articles in academia are the equivalent or, of truth or of objective facts, written in the same year about how big chocolate, pork, pork meat, or coconut oil are good for your health, bad for your health, deadly, or make you lose weight, or make you gain weight. Gain weight. So there is a clear correlation between time pressures and production. It is quantity rather than quality that is systematically desired. So there are two things that we do to try to kind of counterbalance this. We give authors considerable time to think, to write, and to, and to think about the comments we make about what they wrote. We also allow ourselves time to revise, to reread, to discuss with them, to go in depth. This, of course, results in a very slow and long editorial process, which is opposed to the readiness of post-truth. Also, if, we're, if we feature per issue three or four artists, we commission two essays about each artist that look at their practices from two different perspectives. For example, for our previous issue, we had, um, yeah, that's the cover, no, no, no. Well, that, that in the background, that was the cover of our previous issue. Uh, and we had, for example, uh, we featured Lubaina Kimij, uh, now Turner Prize nominee, amongst other artists. And we commissioned two essays. One by Hannah Black, which was poetic, which was political. And then another one uh, by Griselda Pollock, which was extremely art historical and revised like uh, he needs practices from the, from the very beginning. So what I mean is that this allows for a more in-depth investigation. This means that within one issue we have opposing opinions or perspectives, but both, both well documented, researched, and thought about. Finally, now that we're talking about the importance of research, after all, it's now not only a publication or a series of publications, but also a research center, after all, research center. <coughs> this transition was motivated by precisely all of what is well, precisely by by what we think that is wrong, wrong with post-truth. So we wanted to become research or more research oriented. So time and resources could be invested in the work uh, that we already did. Uh, we want to participate in shaping a public sphere as much as we want to be shaped by the public. But we also don't want to assume a public that is passive and homogeneous, nor presenting ourselves or our medium as a machine of objective facts, which counterweights post-truth. As much as we're aware that the public and our public is heterogeneous by nature, we're also very proud of the heterogeneity that you can find in our artists, our writers, from diverse backgrounds, from different parts of the world, with diverse interpretations, working with different media. And now having said all these, and just to finalize, there is actually one way in which we are kind of post-truth uh, because if you think about what is truth in the history of art, traditionally truth has been associated to the way in which some things, art objects and the objects of art, have been produced, disseminated, and retrospectively studied in the West. The history of art has been the true narrative articulated around what is known as art, again, in the West. Although things are certainly changing in this regard, we are actively looking at diverse ways in which this narrative has been articulated in other parts of the world. For example, for this, for this issue, that the upcoming issue in October, we're looking at, uh, there's one really interesting article about uh, the contemporary art scene in post-Soviet Mongolia. There is another article about the Kazakh art scene and nomadology. We feature Pia Arke and her ethno-aesthetics and Nordic colonialism. So we, yeah, and now, for example, I'm looking and commissioning about what triggered the Malaysian contemporary art scene. So I would say that it, it is in this diversity, in, in looking of what's happening elsewhere, that we can reshape or rethink the definition of post-truth. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to come back around to examining whether whether the exception that is a research journal nullifies post-truth or, or, or really uh, manages to, to um, change sort of the overall environment. But, but, but first to, to Mr. McGarry. Hello. Um, I think you've got some, uh, some sexy, they are sexy, diagrams to show us. Yes. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, so I wanted to sort of um, organize my frustrations about art writing as of late into something that I could draft and share with everyone during this uh, panel. And to begin that, I started uh, to try to think of a way to sort of organize the different products of art journalism um, in order to map them and sort of uh, compare and contrast them. And the two spectrums that I came up with, um, in my experience, I've been, or I should say, I guess this is sort of mentioned in my intro, but I've done a lot of uh, writing for different publications. Um, I've always sort of enjoyed the flexibility of moving around and writing in different voices and in different contexts, but also sort of struggle with the frustrations of needing to go through a pitching process and um, I don't know, it's been good and it's been bad. But anyway, um, art journalism can be plotted along a spectrum of subject matter, uh, and that being writing that's about art or writing that's about money. Naturally, most things may have to do with uh, both, there'd be some kind of hybrid. And then the other spectrum, that I was looking at was sort of the mode in which art journalism is written, which is either sort of investigating and reporting facts or uh, fashioning opinions. So um, here's a chart about that. Sorry, I'm also struggling with multiple devices. Um, so you have fashioning opinions about art, fashioning opinions about money, reporting acts about money, reporting facts about art. Um, so, um, examining the post-truth era, I think it's important first to sort of talk about um, what happened with art journalism in the truth era. Uh, and I, oh, sorry about the funny words breaking up. Um, so, I, I find that um, sort of the two abstract Qual um, values on the upper right, sort of art, which is inherently an abstract thing, and opinions, which also sort of can't be pinned down. Um, those two come together in sort of an exploration or, or pursuit of like an abstract truth or the soft power of art, it, it, the way that it, uh, it, it can influence culture, society, and politics. Uh, and that sort of inherently opposes the two more concrete values that I was looking at, which is uh, money, which is sort of a more of a cold, hard reality, um, and reporting facts, those being sort of the pursuit of a concrete truth, hard power of art. Um, so I would say fashioning opinions about art is art criticism, and reporting facts about money is market reporting. Um, to, to me, and I hope to everyone, they're both totally legitimate, important forms of truth-seeking that actually serve to counterbalance each other because they serve different purposes in sort of educating and uh, revealing things to the public about sort of what is art, what is the context of art, but also how does it function in society um, and what does it do other than just exist as art. Um, so I see these two things as fundamentally interrelated, even though they're also fundamentally separated and equally important in sort of um, in a critical art ecosystem. Um, this is the most flashy slide. So um, social media has made people more interested in contemporary art. Um, but our criticism art marketing, sorry, uh, our criticism and art market reporting are main niche. Um, I think that social media is very much a part of the post-truth era. Uh, if we're going to some of these definitions of post-truth, sort of the cherry-picking of um, facts can also be thought of on an individual basis or sort of like an experiential lived um, post-truth existence, cherry-picking of experiences, what you choose to transmit to people on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Um, I think that uh, Contemporary art has become, you know, you can see in lifestyle publications now, rather than like living in some kind of like design or culture vertical, you often see like art. Uh, art is something that is fast becoming a part of mass culture. That should be exciting for artists, that should be exciting for dealers, for museums, for everyone. Um, but it's also problematic because um, people 
who have come to art to consume art experiences aren't necessarily interested in sort of the truth-seeking pursuits of art criticism or art market reporting. Um, and I, so, oops. Oh. <laughs> So if they're not into art criticism or art market reporting, and I, I'm sure that some people are, but I'm just, um, sorry. Um, oh, well, it, it led me to think about the, the two quadrants that I hadn't filled in yet, which are sort of inherently more confused because, um, again, there are really no known facts about art. And in the same way, it's harder to be sort of opinion-driven about uh, money. Uh, oops. Um, and what I've experienced in writing about art is that uh, sort of this desire to have sort of like easily gettable, fact-driven reporting and access to art sort of suffices as reporting facts about artists and the lives that they live. Um, and that um, this is also something you see with curators and something you see with collectors too. You see more and more stories about sort of the um, supposedly like bohemian lives of curators who may actually function more and more as in some cases like fundraisers and um, I don't know. It's sort of getting away from things. Uh, and so I, I feel that reporting on art has, is beginning to resemble lifestyle reporting, at least in this mode. There's still lots of art criticism, there's still lots of art market reporting, but there's sort of, um, what's, what's new is this like extreme desire um, evidenced, I think, in at least the content that's being produced online and in print. Uh, for there to be sort of lifestyle reporting about art, to know what it's like to live the glamorous life of artists or people who collect art or otherwise involved in the art world. Um, and I don't mean this is a broad condemnation of this type of journalism. It's something that I do myself and I think it's something that can be really interesting. Uh, it's also not a new thing. A good New Yorker profile on an artist is perfectly capable of being more illuminating and art historically significant than a feature essay in art forum, but I feel that there is sort of a disproportionate um, interest in generating this type of material. Uh, and I can say, just as um, somebody who's been working for about 15 years, that it's so much easier to get paid well to do this type of work and to find placements for it because there's, um, there's seemingly like endless range of hotel magazines, airline magazines, etc., that want sort of nonsense reporting about artists. Um, so, oops, this is also not meant to be a condemnation, but um, it's very interesting to me <laughs> that both lifestyle magazines and even some art magazines now put artists on the covers as celebrities. Um, I happen to write the Surface Magazine piece on Sterling Ruby in the bottom left. Um, I think it's a good piece, I enjoy doing it. Um, I'm bringing this slide up as a symptom of the post-truth era in which the celebrity of artists is marketable enough for lifestyle magazines to leverage on their covers, and it's tolerable enough to some art publications to transgress the taboo of putting an image of an artist not only beside but before reproductions of their work. Um, oops. The grid is gone, um, but this, so sort of going back to um, that chart, um, th sort of thinking what is fashioning opinions about money and what might be able to counterbalance or what is needed, what we need more of, I think at this time, is uh, sort of market criticism or people, um, uh, more like serious journalism that's sort of not only reporting on transactions and breaking news, but sort of considering what are the implications of different um, collections, what are like the aesthetics of different private museums that are growing up, what, what does that mean uh, to our history, what does that mean to the institutional landscape, 
And um, it's interesting, I, um, I meant to say at the beginning of my presentation that I felt that a lot of the things that Sarah brought up kind of uh, echo my own thoughts about this. Um, and we had discussed in a call like the Mark Rochen piece, and when I reread it, I saw that actually that piece is ostensibly meant to be sort of a piece of market criticism in a way, um, because it's ostensibly not about the, um, not meant to like be fluff to promote his market, but to be a trend piece about sort of look at this, there are artists who are deciding to go in a new direction, they're changing the way in which they work with their galleries, they're having more autonomy over their markets, but it just came across like so abysmally and was so gratuitous. Yeah, well totally, yeah, I mean it was malpractice, but um, I don't know, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I think a kind of cool counterpoint to that kind of piece is this, um, I don't really think it's published anywhere, but this commentary by the Zurich and Basel-based gallerist Jean-Claude Freeman-Guth, who uh, sort of abruptly closed his space a week or two ago, and he wrote a very um, sort of moving letter um, referencing the, the st sort of struggles that caused him to close up shop, but um, sort of about alienation, and um, I don't know, I'd like to see more of that. Sorry, I sort of lose, yeah. Um, that's all I had to say. This is the Thank complete thing. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Listen, uh, in terms of the dichotomy uh, you just laid out, but folks who write for money, I mean, pardon me, <laughs> we all write for money, hopefully. Uh, people who write about art, people who, who, who write about money. Um, Kenny is, is definitively sort of in the, in the latter uh, end of, the, of that dichotomy. You, you mostly write about money. So give us, give us your take on Not necessarily. Well, okay. Well, at least on the market. Right. Well, you know, I'll just get into it. Go on. When I think of the post-truth, I think of when after the inauguration when Trump said that there was Tens of millions of people in the, in the mall, wherever, during the inauguration, when in fact he overstated the audience uh, of the inauguration to buttress his position and his standing in his own eyes or to try to convey that to people. And I think I'm, it's, I'm primarily an art market writer, but basically I just, I write about art as well and I write about my life through the art market and I also do what you do and I very much take a critical position in relationship to the transactional side of art fairs and auctions in particular, besides other things. So I used to do a lot of uh, art fairs myself. I've been in and out of, thrown out of art fairs and in art fairs. And I remember once doing a fair and being interviewed by Bloomberg, and they said, how did you do? And I said, I sold things. I, did, I didn't sell a damn piece in the entire fair. But you don't want to sit there in front of an audience and say how I failed fabulously. I haven't lost all my money, the hotels, the planes, the shipping, the insurance. It's been an abysmal failure, and there you have it. You make sure you spell my name right. <laughs> so um, there are, you, it's funny because you think that the market is such a black and white thing, but there's a lot of gray area. <laughs> so this is, there's a couple of families that have disproportionate influence in the market. I obscured their identity, not very <laughs> So, to protect their identity. So I can remember an auction a few years ago where the head of the family, there was a lot of Jean-Michel Basquiat lot that came up at a Phillips auction, and the dad was on the telephone, and the lot was bought in. It failed to sell. And once he got off the telephone two or three lots later, when he realized this was the case, he ran up to the podium to the auctioneer, and he had them march out the piece again and put it back on the block where he proceeded to buy it. And for all we know, it was his piece. So the auctions are really the last area in the market where there can be these types of manipulations going on where we're not really fully cognizant. You think it's such, you think it's, it's, a, it's a, a piece sells for X amount of money and that's the end of the story, but it's just not really the case. And it's not just in auctions per se, but in charity auctions where you see these gigantic prices paraded around, there are instances which are completely not, have never been spoken of where people, they're giving out guarantees in these auctions. In this auction, perhaps even for this very piece, the consigner received a substantial 
upfront guarantee on a piece that was for a charity auction. I mean, Leonardo DiCaprio stages these environmental auctions all the time, fabulous sums of money trade hands, and again, you have these kind of, these non-published situations where there's more to it than meets the eye in terms of what's actually going on behind the scenes. Back to the Damien Hirsch show. I mean, in this article, where for Art uh, Net, where I write, it was reported how, how fantastic this show was selling, and they reported people that had bought pieces, and I called a couple of the people in the article, and they didn't buy pieces. They absolutely didn't buy the pieces. So, I mean, there was one article that Sarah mentioned where the show was disparaged, and it was enormously well read, and at the same time, you have a lot of these fawning pieces in legitimate publications, including one that I write for, which, I mean, I just did some simple digging myself and found there to be untruths in this article, that it wasn't selling as much as this kind of, you know, PR campaign was purporting to. It, weirdly, no byline on that piece, by the way. Yeah. No, this was, it was, but this was kind okay, of... Okay, okay. Yeah. You, yeah, well, that's another story by the museums. <laughs> Then I, I was asked to do a literary festival in Wales some time ago, and this is another subject that's been touched upon. And I was participating in a BBC television show about the art market. They asked me to do this literary festival. I went to Wales, and there was a bunch of very sleepy people in the audience. So I proceeded to, to dissect a financial transaction that had recently happened at Christie's. And I had no idea that the audience was basically like 300 journalists from all the newspapers. <laughs> There's so many newspapers in London, and boy, did I get like a terrible surprise because I reported on a situation where a friend of mine was selling a piece of Christie's, and besides the fact that they damaged the piece the night before the auction, then the piece was sold, it was guaranteed, and if you make, if you guarantee a work, and then if you go to bid on the piece that you guaranteed at auction and you win the piece, you get a finance fee. So you get a credit back from the auction house. You put down a guarantee. You ended up winning the piece. So let's say this piece was recorded in the books as being sold for $2 million. But I know for a fact that it was sold for 1.75. So if you do a price research in Artnet, uh, it's listed as $2 million. But it never sold for $2 million. Before the piece was even paid for, it was back on the market by the person who allegedly bought it for less than $2 million. So, this is absolute lies, plain and simple. Whether it's false truths, political false truths, it's just not the case, and it simply shouldn't be permissible because it's... Anyway, what happened was the Daily, it ended up to be in the Telegraph, and it was a full page, three in the Times in London about my little chit-chat, but the Daily Mail was gonna actually dissect the transaction. I would have lost like a good portion of my yearly income because I would have alienated so many people besides giving rise to many lawsuits, which sometimes happens to me. So back to our friend Mark Rochon. He just posted, so he posted this in Instagram just about last week, and he said, yo, Phillips, direct message me. I'm not sure I made this. Either way, it sucks. So again, doing a little investigative digging, I found out who the letter K stands for, and Mark Rochon had given this person the piece because she had been selling some of his pieces, and she turned around and sold this gift. It's coming up in Phillips in a matter of a week or so. And this is an interesting, it, it relates to when Richard, I wrote an article about when Richard Prince tried to disclaim his work of art. I would buy that piece if Ivanka ever wanted to deaccession it, because I think it's a fabulous thing with the great history, the fact that an artist has stated that this is not an artwork, when it's on canvas, and what Richard Prince failed to mention, what he failed to mention was, he, she bought, she gave a commission to him. So he didn't just make a piece that happened to, to depict Ivanka Trump. She commissioned him to make a picture of Ivanka Trump. He took the commission, paid the money, and in the end, typical art world style, he refunded the money to the advisor who sold the piece. He was the go-between between Ivanka and Richard Prince, and he, the, the advisor kept the money because Ivanka didn't want the money back. She kept the piece. So for the dealer, it ended up in the best of all possible worlds. He, he sold the piece twice and get, kept all the money. But there's another situation where back, I mean, I'm, 
anytime I put a microphone in my hand, I tend to put my foot into my mouth and get foot and mouth disease. But keep going. Keep this, going. This, this actor who does this environmental situation, he sells more art than, than art dealers do for some unbeknownst reason. And he bought a piece directly from the studio of a very well known artist. And then he turned around and sold it. A friend of mine bought it and put it into auction. And then the artist, Rudolf Stengel, was going around telling everyone that the piece was damaged and was in terrible condition, similar to what Mark Rochon is questioning the authorship of his piece. It's very clearly and distinctly a Mark Rochon piece. And if there was truly any issue about its authenticity, it would immediately be thrown out of the auction. But Stingle went around telling Larry Gagosi and various other people that this piece had been catastrophically damaged when I had seen the condition report and the piece was in absolutely perfect condition. So this helped to really impede the, 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 the success of the piece at auction. So, I mean, back to my situation, I think worse than the lies, the art world has an aversion even more so to lies than to the truth. So when I tried to write behind the scene transactional sort of the way that I'm talking right now in my articles, I have been threatened with literally like 20 lawsuits, not for lying, for telling the truth, which is like when you think about, okay, when you think about hyperbolizing why Donald Trump is spinning facts all the time is because he's simply trying to present himself in the greatest possible light. When I'm being interviewed about an art booth that failed and I'm saying I sold some stuff, I just don't want to project myself as being a terrible loser during the course of this given art fair. So, but the art world has this insane aversion to people telling the truth. And I've written for the past few years, I've written for Art News with Sarah and for the New York Observer before that, and for the last two or three years I've been writing for Artnet, and every single time someone has called to complain about my articles, which is pretty much 80% of the time, without even telling me they've, take, they've withdrawn my contentious writing, without even speaking to me or asking me to back up my facts, which is just kind of shocking. But that really boils down to the fact that there's no money in our journalism None of these companies are making any money. None of these internet companies that are, I mean, I can't speak for your business or anyone else's business, but I get the sense from what I read in the financial papers, et cetera, that none of these platforms are making very much money. I had to take a tremendous, substantial pay cut to continue to write for our net, to have the platform to reach the audience that I want to have, mainly because the audience is, a, it's a micro audience. But this is a famous lawyer from New York. I wrote something. We, we, don't, we haven't spoken for years. We were friendly. We actually owned paintings together, and we had a falling out. And I was in the middle of the Basel Miami Fair, and he called me an <laughs> effing asshole and started screaming and yelling at me. And I wrote about this, of you course, because, for me. yes, well, that's what I do. <laughs> oh, so you, you, so I, <laughs> he called and complained and threatened to sue, and what did they do? They took out my story. My story about him, which was maybe 20, 15% of my article, it was 100, I never lied. I mean, sometimes I get a few percent wrong facts because I speak to various people and I get stories, but I painfully, and you took it out, right out. And I kept it up on my website, but that's happened to me 10 times. And the art world has an allergy to the truth. It's simple as that. It's not the lies that I fear in, the art, in, in reporting on the art sector. It's people freak out about the truth. And he's one of them. I wrote a story. I, I, I absolutely told the truth of what happened and out it went. Since I, since I have a new editor now at Arnett, Andrew Goldstein, for the first time, he, he defended, like, he, literally he was two weeks into the job, and five lawyers from Sotheby's are on his ass trying to sue him because of, like, the second article I wrote for him. And it was about a situation where a certain person, her company was bought by Sotheby's. She had used, uh, she disingenuously tried to buy, bought this Baselitz painting, saying that it was going to a very illustrious collector into a museum, when in fact it was going into an art fund that this business ran. And then when her business got taken over by Sotheby's, she went and just chucked the piece into auction, and I wrote about this whole story, and Sotheby's went nuts. It was, maybe I got a few little bits wrong, but the thrust of what I was writing about, the gist of it was 100% entirely true, and they went up in arms and nuts. But thankfully, like, maybe it's a matter of, because of the state that we're in now, that Andrew was more determined to take a position and to take a stance in relationship to this type of situation, which I've experienced time and time again. He did say he removed it from the piece. Yeah, he did he, say, yeah. He, he, he kept the, 
he kept the fact that it went into auction, it was bought by false pretenses, and I said that maybe Sotheby's continued to have an ownership role in the painting, and that's what they denied. But the point is, I mean, really, you just have to take every single damn thing with a grain of salt, and you have to understand that people are very self-interested, they're all hyperbolizing, exaggerating. I mean, I could, I'm finished. But I could just say one other thing. I could say, I'll probably be finished sooner than later because of my big mouth, but I mean, there's another thing that kind of disturbs me, and there's a piece of art in this fair by a very famous deceased artist, and the piece was cast in the last couple of years, when this artist died 50 years ago. So posthumous casting of art by Gia Cometti, by Brancusi, by Ernst, by Miro, I think it's just wrong. I mean, if there's any fake uh, a lie, that's a lie. I mean, you're purporting to sell a Brancusi, it's just a tchotchke, basically. So, so, maybe, okay. so maybe the art world is, is, you know, has been post-truth sort of from the very get-go. I want to read a quote to you, a very famous quote from 2006, uh, and we'll identify later, but want to be well. The, the best kind of art is the most expensive because the art market is so smart. And, uh, who said that? Anybody out in the audience? Tobias Meyer, right? Very famous auctioneer. Was, is that, is that post-truth? No, it was Tobias Meyer. <laughs> it was Tobias Meyer. But the art market basically sort of is the, is the uh, North Star for value all the way across, right? Um, I mean, that is a clearly very self-interested kind of viewpoint uh, with regards to uh, works of art and his business and, and, and what, the, what the auction market does. Um, uh, and it excludes lots of other stuff. I mean, I'm wondering how you guys react to that. Does it ring like post-truth? There's been plenty, there's been plenty of artists over the course of history that had tremendous markets, and 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 years later, the markets went to zero or substantial. I mean, the sense of value changes over the course of history, so it's not a fixed notion that X amount of money in the year 2017 signifies Yeah, no, I market. get that, but, but the idea that the market should be the sole determining sort of factor, and that's essentially what Meyer is saying in that quote, it's a, it's a pretty famous quote, it, it, in, in the terms that sort of Kevin laid out, you know, it's the hard power sort of like, equa it, there's only hard power in that equation as opposed, as opposed to the sort of the symbolic power of art. So the symbolic power of art is accounting. Uh, so in that sense, it seems to me to be, you know, uh, not just with a thumb on the scale, it's got thumb, foot, and ass on the scale. And so where I'm going with this is like, okay, you've, you've laid out a pretty convincing case, some of you uh, uh, as well in your presentations, that, you know, in a way, post-truth has been with us for a while, right? Uh, um, as, at least as long as we've been, we've been working. There's an argument to be made that things have been dialed up to 11. But maybe let's examine the idea that, that you know, uh, uh, that art, the art market, the art world, even art symbolic value has, uh, um, has lots of confusion in it, has lots of doublespeak has lots of different kinds of valuation that make truth a fairly sort of slippery idea. Am I the only one who sort of like thinks that? I mean, you guys have been speaking to this. Kenny, you, Sarah? I think that's fair to say. I mean, um, you know, if you see these headlines about these pieces that sell for these extraordinary amounts of money, I mean, to go into Kenny's territory a little bit. It's like that, I heard an anecdote yesterday from someone about the Basquiat that sold for $110 million and that you know a group of dealers was betting on how much it would sell for and they were exchanging $100 bills after the sale and like, oh, it's, you know. And one person who was is heavily into the Basquiat market had beforehand been saying, that piece is an 11, that piece is an 11, and then afterwards was like, oh, it was a six after it sold for $110 million, right? Because he got what he needed from the result. So now he can be honest and be like, it's a six. So, you know, what's the value of that piece? Like, 
if that person, because they're invested in Basquiat's market, is going around and saying, oh, that head that sold um, at Sotheby's is totally as good as the one that's in Eli Broad's collection, when other people would be like, no, it's not. It's clearly not. I mean, then what, you know, is that person promoting false value, you know, for their own reasons? I also, I have to respond to that Gallup thing, which is, I, you were right. You know, journalism, it's in a crisis. There's no money in it. It's hard to get advertisers. If you're not, I mean, Artnet is lucky to be, although it's a mixed bag, right, to have the, the art, the database, the power pages, which to a certain extent can support the, the, um, the news site, right, the magazine. Um, you know, if you're in traditional journalism, you don't have that luxury. Um, so, you know, I think in the situation of Gallup, if indeed that was removed, it's like that's not the thing you fight to keep. Like, Andrew's right to keep that because that's good, that's good information, which you report all the time. Right. But it's like he was, bully, he was bullying you, and it was part of his story, and he bullied you and just flexed his muscle because he had more financial but, clout. So but it was what a I'm saying, of, of journalism. I mean, but I would say it's, it's maybe a compromise worth making if that's not the valuable part of the article, right? Okay, Gollum's a bully. Like, who cares, you know? It's, 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 I think it's more important to have, you know, some of this stuff about how these transactions are actually happening. You know, so if he were to sue the New York Observer, which, God, I in retrospect, I probably should have just let him. Um, you know, then we have to go to court and pay a media lawyer for what? Because we, we want to say this guy's actually a bully? He's a litigator. It's like, of course he's a bully. You know, like, you have to like, pick your battles. You know, that's all I'm saying. Okay, if, if that was removed, it's like, I guess that's on us for removing it. But I would say, like, sometimes you do have to make those compromises. Let's spin this out for another three or four minutes, and then we're going to take questions. Uh, I mean, you know, I guess part of the point I was trying to make with the Tobias Meyer quote is that if the art market is the real repository of art value, then I'm out of a job. Uh, and so is everybody, every other art critic in, you know, in the world. Uh, but, so, yeah, but can I just say one yeah. other thing about, like, the reporting aspect? Yeah. And, you know, I read Kenny religiously. He's one, of, he's, you know, among the best people writing about the art market. Um, However, he has, you have an advantage that, for instance, like Katya Kazakina at Bloomberg does not have, which is that you're in the business, something you completely disclose. She is not. Um, and so I think, you know, that's something to keep in mind. It's, it's, it's a different level of access that I think, you know, a journalist who has always just been a journalist, moving from beat to beat, they're on real estate, then you know people don't get the organization doesn't want them to go native, so they move them to art or they move them to this. That person's not going to have access just by definition. Well, but maybe they're not doing their job properly. I mean, that's maybe something that's come up several times here in this panel. You know, is that you know maybe they should be sort of doing a little bit more investigating. No, no, but I think Kevin. As, so as you're Kevin's saying that you're saying that Katya should sell art. And no, 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 no. Because that's what I'm talking. About. I'm saying that certain, that investigative. Journalism in the market might be one way to basically uh, apply some sunlight to to, to the double speak, of course, and the the post truthiness of of, 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 uh, of the artwork. Yes, and she's doing that to the best of her ability. I think she's one of the best people reporting on art right now. But there are limits in this when there's so much money at stake and it's an opaque environment. Yeah. There are limits to the kind of information you can get and the kind of information you can report. You, you know, know, when you have, when she has her editor going like, okay, do you have three sources on that? Okay, do you have, you know, that's going to be hard in, in the art world. Yeah, but you know, I mean, look, we, we all know the kinds of situations that, that you mentioned. You know, the chandelier bidding, the guarantees. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't find that they're reported as assiduously as 
I don't know, financial crimes in papers. And I know the difference in resources that there is between our publications and, say, for example, I don't know, even the Tribune or the New York Times or the Washington Post. But it seems to me that that's probably where a lot more energy should go. And it doesn't go there because there's a lot more energy and a lot more money going towards promotion. You know, it's certainly it's not going to criticism. That's another sort of like a, a It's a also very political touch to <coughs> not go a, up against these people that have loads of money. Which yeah, they have well, wield a lot of powers, like in all of the instances where Mark Spiegel no from Basel no threatened doubt. and the art newspaper threatened Artnet when I mentioned the art newspaper in an article. No it's, doubt, but that, that great uh, Justice Brandeis line about sunlight being the best disinfectant, I mean, you know, it, it, there's a way in which the art world, and let's be honest, we've all been honest, is, you know, possibly like the cradle, the original sort of source of post truthiness. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I, and, and, I, and, I, and I do think that it's probably that, that, you know, and I, you can call bullshit each one of you if you want, but, but that there is a, a, a lack of resources in that, in that area of art writing that I find alarming. My own personal history, at, for example, at Artman when I, when I was there for a couple of years, was that at least with a changeover from Ben Ginocchio to Rosalia Jovanovic, that that stuff was de-stressed significantly. And so I was actually brought on to do specific kinds of work, criticism and to do that, and I was essentially asked not to do it. Uh, and that seems to me to be, I mean, I'm, I'm extrapolating my own personal experience out to, 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 and generalizing it possibly too much, but it seems to me to be, at least in my reading uh, um, of our journalism, something that seems fairly endemic. Maybe I'm wrong. But can I, I just want to point out one more thing, which is that, you know, we're, we're sitting on this stage and we're in an art environment, so we can say, oh, these people are so powerful and the, the amounts of money are so big, but what is the art market, what is it, a $65 billion, that's the, you know, how 80. 80, okay. Yeah. But still, compared to the financial industries and, and to other, you know, it's, so, for instance, you, if you go back to the article that um, Sarah Thornton, when she was writing about uh, the art market for the economist way back in 2010, she like called bullshit on that Phillips sale, the, uh, the Philippe Segula sale, okay? And it's like, no regulators cared, no one cared. You know, it's not like, like no one got in, in trouble for that being like. That is true. Not a straightforward sale. That is true. It's just that it's. It's a victimless crime. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, listen, uh, uh, we're, we're way over, actually, and there are dinners and parties to go to, but I want to open it up to the, to the folks that are here if they have any questions or any comments or, or you, know, you want to, again, call BS on any of what's been said. Anybody? And thank you. Yeah. Into the microphone. Thank you. Um, I have a question about proving the intrinsic value of a piece. Do you believe in that theory, or is it all subjective? Uh, symbolically, uh, as an art critic, I tell you yes. Unfortunately, it's all subjective. You People don't just believe me because I write things. So you don't uh, believe that there's an intrinsic value in a piece, um, and let's say an artist invents a technique, and when that artist dies, the technique dies with them. No, you listen, it's like that's a, valuable. It's like an oh no, absolutely. I think it's immensely valuable, okay. but it's it's like uh, it's like uh, you know, a saying a novel or or a great piece of dance or a great great piece of theater. Intersubjectively, you know, over history, well, even even at the time, you come up with some kind of uh, notion of its value, and that's sort of what's out there. And then history takes care of the rest <laughs> somehow. Um, now, financial values are something else, mm -hmm. um, you know. So, which is you know why you have um, you know endless crappy Broadway plays going on for years and years. <laughs> sure. and years. It's not just that, it's that in, you know, an artwork that sold in you know, 1985 for X amount of money um, might be completely valueless right now. Like yeah. you never bring it to auction, it's worth zero money. Yeah, like because of the popularity. You could just, just destroy it. Mm -hmm. but, like, but is that of value in some cultural sense? Yeah, the of cultural course it is. Sense. You know, that artist um, made a contribution. Someone had a thought that produced this, that produced that. Yeah. Or they, you know, invented a technique. Someone went on to use it better. Like it's just different definitions of value. I think, on a certain level, like with more like historically canonized art, I believe that there's an inherent objective value to art. If you take a Picasso that's 12 inches square of certain colors with a certain composition from a certain year, 
all of these criteria that help to substantiate and create value. If you take this Picasso and put it in front of five experts in the field, you'll get a valuation within five percentage points of each other. Yes. And I just think, I think like a lot of people could disparage art and say it's wildly subjective, but I think there's an inherent notion of quality which holds forth. Well, how does that apply to, to, to Richter's then? Richter's. I mean, you know, yeah, we'll be kicked out. But yeah, yeah. So listen, I think that's it. And thank you very much for coming. And uh, cheers to you.